Tonight we're going to start not talking about New Orleans or Louisiana. We're going to start talking about why this place might be valuable. Now, it's valuable for our culture, it's valuable to our histories of people, and, and for all these reasons. But while that's true, even if none of that were the case, New Orleans, Hurricane Katrina, important, I would argue, important foreshadowing of what is most likely coming to the rest of the world. Uh, did climate change intensify and make the impacts on New Orleans worse? Mo yeah, they did. Um, but, that's th but that's debatable, it's hard to prove exactly. But that's, again, beside the point. It doesn't matter if climate change really did or didn't, because the way it unfolded is exactly the way things are gonna unfold in the future. Regardless about the fingerprint of climate change on this particular disaster, it is a useful lens with which to look at coastal zones around the world going forward. And so knowing nothing about the culture, knowing nothing about the injustice and all the things that are wrapped up in the history and all this and that, um, we could simply benefit from going to New Orleans and Southern Louisiana to think about risk, to think about uh, what is acceptable, what isn't acceptable, and to glean lessons for other places, uh, even if there were no music, even if there were no uh, jambalaya or anything like that. So this picture, Actually, let me say one, one thing before we get going, which is um, it's very easy to make judgments when we, when we don't have all the facts, right? We, 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 as a species, we've survived by doing that, right? Oh my God, I think I hear a lion in the jungle, I'm gonna run, right? And so, so there's re evolutionary reasons why we might sort of be predisposed to make assumptions and, and do stuff. That's not the best way forward. One of the common things that happens when we hear about a disaster, such as the, the um, dam that just burst, in, or the, actually multiple dams that just burst in Brazil this week, um, uh, you know, whatever it is, you name the, the event, and all oh, those silly people in Brazil living beneath a dam or whatever, um, ultimately, this gets down to what is acceptable and what is what is an acceptable level of safety? What is an unacceptable level of safety? What is risky? What's not risky? So this picture, this is a, a picture from Oxfam. And uh, I would posit that in this case, uh, this particular location with this amount of rain, not a good thing, right? So whoever designed that road didn't design it to deal with, uh, in this case, torrential downpours, right? These much more intense weather events. One of the things climate change is doing is not only you know, making this thing happen or that thing happen, but making all of the things that we're talking about, snow, rain, wind, whatever, much more intense and much more variable. So that our climactic system, our planetary system is becoming less predictable and more noisy. So we might talk about global warming, which is the original term, we might talk about climate change, which was the word that a conservative operative that didn't want people to think of, climate, uh, of, of the changed climate system as a bad thing, they, they um, focus grouped the term climate change because it seemed less scary. Turns out it's a better word than global warming because under climate change, some of the word, world is definitely getting warmer, other parts are getting colder. Some of the parts of the world are getting drier, some are getting wetter. So by using the term global warming by itself, that, that gives the impression with some people that stuff is, is going one way. And so for example, now we're having this record cold snap across the country, maybe the coldest ever recorded right now in the northern part of the interior part of our country this week. That has led the gentleman that is the president of the United States to say things like, where's global warming when you need it, right? So that's ignorant, 
and that completely misunderstands the true threat that's coming towards us. So climate change is actually a, a, probably a better term. But the term that I most prefer, if I had to pick one term, <coughs> is not climate change, it's not global warming, it's global weirding. Because that's really what's happening. Things are getting just stranger and stranger. So this bridge where these folks are, this roadbed that had supported them for decades and decades, ain't working now, right? And that's part of the story of New Orleans, and that's part of the story of our world that we are, we are inheriting as we go forwards. So again, the understanding what is risky and thinking about what is too risky or what, or what have you is a real important part of this debate. One of the things our friends in Louisiana say, and we'll hear this when we're there, like, oh, you know, Everybody thinks that we live below sea level. Like, well, screw you. Aren't there fires in California? You guys have earthquakes. That freaks us out, right? And, and on and on down the list. So most of the world, most of human settlements are in one way, shape, or form in some level of risk, right? There's very few places that, are, that have a very low probability of hailstorm or earthquake or tornado or what have you, right? Now that's not to excuse, that's not to say that we shouldn't deal with these risks, but um, there's a bit of a phenomenon of, of, of you know, throwing stones at glass houses sometimes with this. Having said that, we need to be much better with dealing with risk. And there are some places where we as a people have traditionally lived that we probably can't live anymore, or at least not live in the same way that we have been living in these areas for the last many hundreds or thousands of years. So for example, here in California, right, our drought is going on, right? So maybe we might be starting to get out of the drought with this rainstorm, but, but the broader picture is regardless of how much rain we get this year, the big story is we are parched and we're getting more and more parched throughout the Western United States. And that's what, that's what this uh, thing is showing that we have, we built our civilization in California on a lot of frozen water in the form of snow in the Sierras and a distribution system that sucked that snow through pipes to our major urban centers, mostly on the coast, and to our Central Valley where we have the most productive farmland in the world. Uh, that's not really working too well right now. Our water here in Ventura County, depends on where we are in the county exactly, but our water comes from basically three broad areas. We have some groundwater, and again, it's going to vary where we are in the county, but it's roughly a third, a third, a third. Uh, uh, our water comes from our groundwater, so our local, local uh, sources. About a third comes from the Colorado River system, from, from this broad aqueduct system that sucks water from the western US and brings it out to California. And then another component comes from the great rivers in Northern California through the, the San Francisco Bay Delta. <coughs> this picture from 2004, I'll note before Hurricane Katrina, this was one little, one little break. So what we're looking at here is on the left, is the, the San Francisco Bay Delta, which is where the ocean water mixes with the fresh water of the, the mountain streams. And uh, we have this mixing zone. And this levee here, and, all, and that's what these cars are on, all that a levee is is a dam on the side of a river. Instead of cutting across the river, it goes along the side of the river. That's what a levee is. So we'll talk about this more later. But a levee is a pile of dirt. A flood wall is when we put something metal or concrete and make it higher. So the whole point of this levee is to mimic what nature does. Which na nature naturally deposits sediments on the side of rivers, and that essentially keeps the river uh, in its channel until the river gets super high, in which case, in natural systems, it jumps out occasionally during, during what we call spring flood events. In this case, we've dammed this system and we've decided we want to, humans know better. We want to control this system. So we're going to tell nature how the water should move. So we've built these dams along the side of this waterway to, to constrict the flow and to tell the flow where to go, et cetera. Well, and, th and then in the area behind the dam, on the right side of this picture, we've put cities. 
We've put towns. We've put uh, rice fields. We've put um, uh, 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 cattle grazing areas, all these kinds of useful things. The term our society uses for this is reclamation. That term comes from the Romans, ultimately. And the idea is, is somehow the, la the, the land has been lost to the water. And by putting up these structures, by putting up some kind of water constrictive thing, water restrictive thing, we will reclaim the land from the bad thing, reclaim the land from the water. And woohoo, that's great. The reality is water and nature always bat last. And so in this case, we had a little break, one break. It took three weeks to plug that. This is in California with all our engine, and this is you know, near Sacramento, near San Francisco. This is not in the middle of you know, nowhere where it takes weeks and weeks to get stuff. This is in the middle of, of you know, close to Silicon Valley and all that kind of high tech stuff. It took three weeks to plug, and then to get the water out was five months. And that one little break was, 90, was a $90 million repair bill. This system, again, is supplying, depends on where we are, but a third-ish of our water here in Ventura County. So if we have an earthquake and these levees fail in a big way and allow the seawater to more easily mix with some of this fresh water and mess with our, our sucking of that fresh water down here to Southern California, that's about it, right? We have a few days. Depends on how the break happens. We have anywhere from five days to maybe a couple weeks, and that's it. So the entity that makes sure that these earthen levees, mind you, this isn't some kind of high-tech synthetic poly, poly nano fiber or whatever, it's just dirt. And it was dirt that was put there originally, you know, 100 years ago or, or, or more. So it's not necessarily permanent, it's definitely not permanent, but it's not necessarily built in the, in the best way. Um, but we have an entity that certifies these structures. It's called the United States Army Corps of Engineers. More about them later. But for now, we'll just say that that same entity is the entity that certified the levees that built and certified the levees in New Orleans that said they were fine. That as we will learn about as we go through the class, uh, they weren't fine. That same entity is the entity that certifies the levees right here on campus that contain Cayugas Creek, the levees that are on um, the, the Ventura River, the levees that are on the Santa Clara River. Same entity. A few years ago, uh, they went and reassessed our levees here, here in Ventura County. 17 were deauthorized, or 17 sections. 17 sections were deemed, actually, you know what? These aren't really safe. So if you just happen to have a house behind those here in Camarillo or some of the other places, you're kind of screwed because you could no longer afford flood insurance. It was no longer subsidized. It got super expensive. And you guys are young. You guys might not own a house. But when, if, you're, if you're pretty wealthy and you could buy a house, you just buy a house. But most people can't just buy a house. They get a loan from the bank and they use that loan money to buy the house. And so the <laughs> bank owns the deed to your house. And then over the course of 10 years, or 14 or 15 years, or 30 years, depending on the lifespan of your mortgage, you pay off that. And then at the end of that period, end of 30 years, then you, you own your house uh, outright. But up until that point, it's the bank's house, right? And you're buying it back from the bank. So the bank puts requirements on you. And one of the things they're going to say is, hey, I'm ba me, banker, I'm not going to own a house that's not protected by insurance. So you have to have flood insurance or I'm not going to give you a loan to buy your house. And so through this mechanism and many, many other mechanisms, understanding risk and understanding natural hazards have a direct impact on our communities and our economic vitality and how, how, uh, you know, how sustainable, quite honestly, these, these, our communities are. So again, the same entity, the Army Corps of Engineers, certifies our levies, certifies San Francisco levies, certifies levies in Louisiana. So that is one example of exactly the same challenges that you and I face as our friends in New Orleans and Buras and Plaquemines Parish and all those places in Louisiana. Um, and I'll just say we've had, the failures are mounting and we have more and more worry about the stability of this very, very um, uh, 
um, detailed and very, very, uh, you know, lots of frills and lots of little teeny subcomponents and stuff network of our uh, levee system in the San Francisco Bay Delta, similar in broad scope to what's, what happened and what grew up in the city of New Orleans. Um, these are some of our levees that were decertified. The red ones were decertified um, about four years ago by the US Army Corps of Engineers saying that, you know what, actually if we have an earthquake or something, this may not hold and protect the people or the property <laughs> behind the levee. Um, we already mentioned we already mentioned the drought that we're experiencing. Um, in this case, this was uh, a couple years ago. This was uh, two years ago, right about right about this time. And so this is drought intensity. So um, uh, the darker the color, the the more intense the drought is. So we were in hardcore drought in 2016. In 2017, we we're still in drought, but you notice, oh my gosh, it's less intense. Why was it less intense? We we're getting a ton of rain. One of the things that this rain did was, you know, it's great. So we we're out, you know, a lot of water, awesome. So our water control systems in the state of California started filling up with water. And that sounds like a good thing. And generally that is a good thing. But in this particular place, um, uh, it caused some problems. So this is the Oroville Dam. This is up in the you know, foothills of the Sierras. And uh, because we had some problems. So this, is a, this was the tallest dam in the US, uh, not, not so much in um, uh, elevation from the sea level to the top, but rather the height of the actual dam, the amount of water there. And what was supposed to happen here is uh, water, so, so uh, we don't want water coming over here, right? We don't want water just going all over every which way. So we typically have um, uh, channels that the water goes down Many of our dams have hydropower and things of that nature, and so these are, these are poured concrete paths that the water can go down with. As the water flows, it doesn't cause erosion or anything of that nature, right? That's how we get water downstream. That's how we do controlled releases, et cetera. But in this case, two years ago, we got so much rain so fast, and again, this is draining a huge area up behind here, this, the, this big uh, watershed, that it was flowing in, we couldn't stop it, it was coming in. And so, so in that case, this drain, which is normally enough under routine operations, wasn't uh, taking enough water. So we uh, had to activate this emergency spillway, and we had to activate this because as this guy was flowing, this concrete started to fail. This area had not been used since, it, it's, since the dam was constructed. And so this guy started flowing. This is the, this is the main, concrete air, uh, main concrete pad, the regular channel. And you can see it's starting to erode here. And, this, and there was no stopping this, right? If we turned off the taps, water would just start to overtop this whole thing and probably cause the failure of the dam, of the dam surface. So they were letting water go down. But now this guy is starting to erode and erode and erode. And it, st it started a little teeny hole, and it got bigger, and it got bigger, and it got bigger. And here's, you know, here's some cars for scale. This is, you know, this is you know, hundreds of feet in the air, this, this explosion of water, and it's just eroding, and, er and people started going, oh my God, if this guy keeps going, and he keeps eroding, 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 it takes just, all of a sudden you could have a catastrophic failure, a massive failure. Has that ever happened? Sure it has, the St. Francis Dam right here in Ventura County that killed an unknown number, hundreds of people, an unknown number of people, built by William Mulholland, uh, and, and was the thing that, that caused his downfall and everything. So that happened uh, essentially up by Santa Clarita and the water blew all the way down from Santa Clarita down through Santa Paula, et cetera, down to the ocean um, in the middle of the night. Um, and, and so that at the time is, it's, and still is the worst dam failure we've had in California history. But people were really worried about this because there's hundreds of thousands of people that live below this area. So then the, then, it, then the story was, hey, okay, let's activate the emergency spillway. The problem is this is just dirt, right? And there's trees and things here. So, so people radically or really quickly started trying to clear the trees as fast as they could. But um, as you can see here, it's starting to spill over, right? It's like, oh my God, we got to get the pressure out and the water is rising, the water is rising. Um, so when we were able to cut it, uh, uh, shut it down. This was during the sort of the, the recovery phase. You can see how big this, this concrete, uh, ho the hole in the concrete was. 
um, and everybody was super worried and freaked out. And there's all these engineering studies and people said, don't worry, it won't collapse. But it was pretty scary. So this is the emergency overflow flowing, going down, uh, taking out trees and everything and flowing down. Then here's the river and here's where all the folks are living down here. So there's emergency, uh, you know, immediate evacuate. Everybody get out, grab your photos in like five minutes and leave right now. Very similar to what happened to us during the Thomas fire. Very similar to what happened to us during the Springs fire in 2013. Very similar to what happened to us just this uh, last few months with the Hill Fire and the Woolsey Fire. More of this stuff overflowing, uh, overflowing, um, and evacuation orders. So this is the area. This is the area below the dam. So this is a, a city park that was getting inundated. So the, the river here is at flood stage, and so normally the river would be in the channel over here where you see the trees, but it's obviously flooded way much higher. This is a regular pagoda, right? This is probably about eight feet, ten feet high right here, and the water's up that high. So. There were clear impacts from this flooding. Thankfully, no one died, and, and the release worked, and, and we didn't have any more rainstorms, and so we were able to um, uh, let the water go out, and the dam did not fail, but it was very scary, very scary. Um, another shot of it in the process of draining. Here's one example of the kind of stuff that was going on still see this as a dangerous situation, though they do say there are reasons for hope. However, they are keeping the evacuations in place for right now. Let's show you some video of the problem. As you mentioned, the Oroville Dam is the tallest dam in America. Several days ago, they started noticing problems with what's called a spillway. Basically, a spillway is a way for the dam to release water so it doesn't overflow. They have a main spillway, kind of looks like a slide, if you will, a cement slide there was some erosion going on underneath of that cement spillway. It eventually caused a hole in the spillway, so they started using a secondary spillway, more of a natural spillway, where they also can release water. Well, that one started eroding. They started seeing more problems. Well, yesterday, things got very urgent. Officials got some news, got some information that made them think that the spillway could be compromised. If that happened, they, that could send 30 feet high flood of water into the neighboring areas. So they ordered the evacuations of more than 100,000 people. Among those evacuated were more than 500 inmates of the Butte County Jail. They were taken to Alameda County. That's something that just came out in this news conference. They said they didn't release where they were taking those inmates to yesterday for safety concerns. However, they say they are making some progress. They were been releasing a lot of water through the spillway, one of the compromised spillways, and they say that has reduced some of the water in the reservoir there, so they think things are looking better. However, they are still not ready to let people back in. Here's more from some local officials. Uh, this is still a dynamic situation. It's still a situation we're trying to assess the damage, and we need to make, we need to have time to uh, make sure that before we allow people back into those uh, areas, it is safe to do so. So, I want to make it clear, the evacuation is still in effect. We're working um, to really in, uh, dig down into the reservoir and move as much water out of that reservoir and so we have space for the storms that we expect to um, come in as well as the snow runoff later this spring. Now, one of the reasons the sheriff was being adamant that the evacuations are still in effect, he said at the beginning of that news conference that there were rumors floating around that the evacuations are going to be lifted at 4.15 this afternoon. He said those rumors are absolutely false. They do not know when they're going to lift the evacuations at this point. As you heard him say, it is still a situation they're monitoring by the minute to see when they might be able to let people back in here. He said he's heard the criticism. A lot of people have complained that maybe they acted too fast. He said it's up to him to secure the community, make sure the community is safe and he can't keep it on his conscience or wouldn't be able to live with himself if he were to let people back in and then something happened to that dam and water started flowing into homes and putting people's lives at risk. So right now, evacuations still in place here in Oroville and the surrounding areas for now. So, all those things, almost exactly, that could be a press conference about the Woolsey fire. That could have been a press conference about Hurricane Katrina. So those themes we see over and over again. These disasters happen, and you know, we have a lot of wonderful emergency professionals that you know, jump into action, but it's always chaotic. What the hell are we do? I don't know. What, the dam's failing? We never, we never train for that one, right? These folks train all the time for what they think possible scenarios are, but 
things don't never go down exactly the way you think, and sometimes they're radically different. So all of a sudden, these guys are like, I don't know, get some boulders and throw it in the hole. Okay, let's do that, right? So there's that level of stuff, right? You had the, you had the technical guy that's up there that looks a little bit like deer in the headlights, like, oh, yeah, we're trying to do this thing. You know, the awesome dudes, but not maybe the most photogenic folks that are all of a sudden are thrust in front of the camera and people are like, give me answers. And like, uh, uh, is it water? You know, that kind of thing. And the people are like, oh my God, these people are incompetent. And, and so th that starts to go, right? Then you have folks like the sheriff or the, or the, the law enforcement authority who's like, hey, we gotta be safe. Safety's the most important thing. People are getting ticked off. Hey, do we really need to evacuate? I don't want to evacuate. So I live at the top of the hill. When the Woolsey fire came through, I went and checked, um, checked out my house. I was, I was doing some fire checking and stuff and, and looking at, at uh, some of the impacts. Um, got into my development just before the, um, uh, the official, before the CHP and folks opened it up through a back door, shall we say. Uh, and um, at least, at least 10% of the folks in my neighborhood, relatively wealthy neighborhood, relatively well-educated neighborhood, a lot of people around me work at Amgen, all that kind of stuff, right? They were in their houses as the hill fire, they never evacuated, they never left, because the, the roads were sealed. You could get out, but you couldn't, you couldn't get back in. So these folks stayed there. Our, our neighbors, or some of our neighbors, were on Facebook. My wife was talking to them on Facebook. Everything's good, we're standing there drinking margaritas. I'm like, what, dude, what are you doing in there? During the Wolves, after the Woolsey fire, I was going around looking at some of our animal impacts, some of our monitoring, and I went up to a canyon, and this guy said, yo, it's a bear. I saw a bear during the fire. I'm like, what do you mean you saw a bear during the fire? Oh, saw a bear during the fire? I'm like, oh, yeah, we don't really have big bears. No, it was a bear. Well, how do you know? Because I saw it. What do you mean you saw it? No, I mean during the fire. Yeah, I saw it during the fire. What do you mean? We stayed. This was a house, a gazillion million dollar mansion, cantilevered over coastal sage scrub and chaparral. I was like, are you stayed in your house? Yeah, that was a man's house, a man's castle. I'm like what? Right? So this, so these things are, at a, we've had enough of these disasters now to clearly understand this is a property of people. This isn't dumbass people in Louisiana or ignorant people up in Yolo County or something. This is what people do, a significant proportion. Some people choose to not evacuate in a disaster. <coughs> Other people, a lot of people, cannot evacuate. They cannot evacuate because they have a, a family member or pet or something, uh, or they just maybe don't have the fiscal wherewithal. Maybe they don't have a car. They don't have a cell phone to call their daughter or son to come pick them up or whatever. So regardless, there are people that will not evacuate even when the message is clear. And again, um, while we can do better, we can educate folks, we can encourage, we can plead and everything, but, but that is just a property of the system. Other properties of the system uh, are folks demanding answers quickly, right? So here's the reporter, the reporter, this guy's from LA. He's LA, but he's up there in Northern California. What's tell, tell us what's going on. So there's also this heightened demand now in our society with all our wonderful internet and all this kind of stuff. People want an answer right now. And one of the things that's become quite clear is rumors start to run the show. In the case of New Orleans, you'll hear about, when we get to this, you'll hear, hear about, you'll hear the police chief saying, well, there's people, sh and you'll hear some other law enforcement officers. Yeah, well, so there's people with snipers shooting at us. All untrue. Those police officers really did believe that people were maybe going to shoot at them or something. They're wearing bulletproof vests in this hot, humid temperature. Not because they're, they're, I think it's fun, but because these untrue rumors got circulated, there's some idiots that are trying to shoot law enforcement officers that were coming to rescue people, right? And we see these rumors propagated over and over again. The new thing in the last couple years are the Russian trolls and their kin actively sowing misinformation during disasters to make people more ticked off for political reasons and other reasons. So that makes, that's really hard, right? So in a regular disaster without social media and out all this stuff, it's hard to know what's going on, right? Our normal communication is broken. We don't have power. We, our cell phones don't work, whatever it is. And then you add the rumor and innuendo going, and, it, and it's a whole nother mix. 
So these properties, these aspects of disasters are not a, a function of New Orleans or Malibu. They are a general aspect of them. This was after we shut it down and you can see how much ero uh, erosion um, and cutting happened on this emergency spillway. Um, evacuation, huge thing. One of the things we'll, we'll see when we're there is this notion of contraflow. Does anybody know what contraflow is? So contraflow is, uh, was, in, was invented in the south, was invented for areas that get hit by hurricanes where, oh my God, we gotta get out of the city right now because here comes a storm. We generally speaking, historically haven't dealt with that. Our, our big, big historic risk in California earthquakes. And we're just like, hey dude, you want a burger? What? It's shaking. And so we don't have a lot of prep for that, right? Uh, with a hurricane, with our modern technology, we can see it coming for days. And so people get warning. Oh my God, in three days it's gonna be here. Get out. And so roads get clogged. And so that's what we're seeing here. This is, in this case, this is roads getting clogged as folks are trying to evacuate um, uh, Oroville. So what <coughs> folks have figured out in places like uh, Miami and New Orleans and Houston is what you do is you get everybody out. Nobody can come in. So you turn the regular lanes you know, going out, but you also turn the lanes that are coming into the city, you shut them all down and you reverse them. So everybody can be on every lane. So the, so the lane that normally people will be driving into the city, it's the other direction, the contra directions. That's where contra flow happened. For the very first time in California history, when we had the Woolsey fire a couple months ago, we used contra flow in Malibu on PCH to get people out of Malibu, right? Fantastic idea. I mean, I wish we didn't have to use it, but, but that kind of thing, we can learn from how our friends in Louisiana deal with disasters. We can learn some things or a thing or two from them as well. Um, uh, and then we get to the politics. So we'll talk a lot about the politics in this class because that unfortunately is part of the response and everything. In our country, uh, for these large scale disasters, federal disasters, we have the Federal Emergency Management Agency or FEMA. And so we'll talk about them too. They're a key part of this. And they're a very small agency. They're very small. They were st stood up by President Carter beforehand. We didn't have such a thing. And they've been a sort of political uh, punching bag. And actually that's a key part of what happened with New Orleans, as we'll see when we get to that part of the story. But FEMA is a, should be a key tool for us to respond. Unfortunately, during the recent government shutdown, one of the things that was shuttered, at least partially, was FEMA. The FEMA folks said, no, 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 we're still doing stuff, but not really. We've had disasters right here as well. So this isn't just a sort of theoretical step back. This is campus uh, with the Camarillo Springs fire that happened in May in 2013. The only reason why campus still exists is because this was a very early fire in the traditional fire summer season. So nobody, or, you know, t lucked out, nobody else in the, in the state had any major fires. So with the, over the span of a few hours, we got a huge amount of help. Hundreds of fire, like three, 300 to 400, I can't remember, several hundred firefighters just on campus, standing right here, saving our buildings. Otherwise, campus would be gone. In the development just up the top of the hill, those fandos, there were 500 fire, 600, one or the other, I can't remember. Hundreds of firefighters up there fighting fires. I saw a picture on the Ventura County. I, whenever these disasters happen, I'm always away. And my wife loves to remind me of this. Like, you're never here, you missed a disaster, but then when things happen, you're never here. Um, and so I was with my son at a, uh, when the Camaro Sp Springs fire happened, he was at, a, he was at Oliva Sadobi doing the, the thing, the, um, the historic reenactment stuff, right? And uh, there's a whole long funny story, but the end point is we're sitting there and the guy's like, it's 18, it's whatever, 1776, we're making butter. And also my phone's like, <laughs> like, what? So we saw the fire going down, but the phone starts, are you guys okay? You know, are you guys out of the house? I'm like, what? And I'm looking at it and the guy's like, sir, it's 1767. You're not supposed to have a cell phone, 1767. I'm like, oh yeah, sorry. But sir, no one have a cell And the kid's like, I'm like, aha, uh -huh, you know, dumbass, you know. And so uh, I'm like, well, then I got it. Sir, you can't have a cell phone, 1700. So 
I'm like, okay, so I finally step outside and um, people are texting me and I go to the Ventura County Star. There's a picture of our then lab. Obviously, this is our lab now, or these are our labs now, and we also have the MODOC lab. But at the time, we only had one lab and it was over at Malibu Hall. So someone had sent me a picture from the Ventura County Star of a firefighter with his back up against the outside wall of our lab building, fire hose full blast, and the flames are about a meter from his face. I was like, oh my God, the lab is gone. So amazing firefighting work saved campus. Otherwise we'd be gone. So we are part of, the, we are absolutely part of this story of increasing disasters, increasing intensity of disasters, things of that nature. This is uh, the area right behind uh, campus over here up behind Malibu Hall. It's before the Springs fire. This is right after, right? So things got scorched, just like the Woolsey fire scorched up, just like Thomas fire scorched. In fact, Thomas and Woolsey were more intense than this particular fire. Um, this fire occurrence is, is more and more. We won't dwell on fire in this class, but, but suffice it to say, what we're looking at here, if you guys haven't seen this before, these are, this is tree ring data. So this is fire history reconstruction um, in the Western US. So on the left-hand side is back in the day, goes back to 1600. On the right is modern time. We do this by tracing uh, tree rings. Uh, tree ring, trees, big trees aren't, ne aren't necessarily, typically aren't killed by, by historic low level fires are just burnt a little bit. So then they keep growing and so we can see these burn marks and so we can, we can do a, a, essentially a tree core and count how old the tree is and backdate it from this year and then actually measure how often the fires are. And if we go do a bunch of trees in an area, we'll get a sense of how broad, how intense that fire is. Was it just one little grove or was it throughout? And what we see is, we see a series of intense fires. So each of these spikes, um, and so on the left hand side, it's of their sampling sites, what proportion of these sites had a fire at that same time, right? So that's a measure of how, how broad the fire was. And we see things are low, things are low, whoop, and a spike, big fire that year. And then it kind of dies back, the fuel loads get, get died down, and things are mellow for a few decades, and then another spike, and then another spike, and another spike. And so things are going along, and then all of a sudden the late 1800s roll around, and then a guy named Gifford Pinchot comes onto the scene, who convinces then President Teddy Roosevelt, probably our greatest conservationist president, to save the forests and to, to enact what we would come to know as the US Forest Service and create our fire suppression policies. Fire is bad. So then we start to suppress the fire. So one, another part of this isn't just climate change and isn't just rising sea levels, it's the policies that you and I support day in and day out. Climate change is part of it, but many other complicating factors are laying, layering over our fire history, just like the history of Louisiana and New Orleans and that kind of stuff. Um, in ter terms of us, this slide is old. <laughs> this, slide is, this is a year old, so it's totally wrong. But um, these are uh, the 20 uh, largest fires, and check it out, all these large fires in the last decade or two. So things are getting more intense. Our, our, our big fires are getting bigger. And we're seeing that played out all over the place. Here's our fire history here in, in our neck of the woods. Uh, this is before the Woolsey, so I don't have the Woolsey on here, but you see, so the big gray thing, that's the Thomas fire. And before the Thomas fire, there was the Ray fire, before the Ray fire, and we just go back and forth. We are in a burning area. Fires are a natural part of our ecosystem. What's not natural is the intensity and the frequency with which we're seeing these fires. PG&E today declared bankruptcy, the Pacific Gas and Electric. So we have three major utilities in the state of California. We have San Diego Gas and Electric, we have Southern, yeah, Southern California Edison, and we have Pacific Gas and Electric. Pacific Gas and Electric, Northern California. So these guys, even though one of the findings came out on Friday that for not last year, but for the year before that, it wasn't PG&E's electrical utilities that caused the fire, uh, that one particular fire. Uh, it was a pro somebody on, uh, electrical stuff on, a pr on private land. Regardless, they still have a $30 billion liability that, they, that people are, are thinking they have to pay for the um, uh, campfire and the associated recent wildfires. So that utility has gone bankrupt. And so uh, Thomas Fire started, uh, associated with utilities. Woolsey fire, hill fire, started with utilities. 
Some of these appear to have been started by some arson, some guys shooting at these transformers to actively make them catch fire. Regardless, regardless, that's us doing it, right? And the systems that we've built aren't the most robust systems. In this case, we're talking about power delivery systems. In Louisiana, it's a, it's a flood wall and, and levees and things like that. We need to be better. We can be better. So this, is, this class also is not about a doom and gloom and, oh my god, things are so horrible, right? But we have to do these lectures. We have to understand what the stress is, but we don't have to accept this, right? We can have more robust, more dynamic, more engaging systems. And, uh, and so this isn't like, you know, scream and, oh my god, the world's over. This is, hey, let's get serious and figure out how we can design more resilient structures. Uh, and, then, and then we get to the Thomas Fire last year, right? So that last picture was Thomas Fire. This is the greater Los Angeles basin at night. This is uh, a NASA satellite is looking down and looking at light pollution. That's and there's, that's, that's right, that in and of itself is crazy. So before we get to the disaster, that's crazy, right? That's a major alteration of the system, a major hardening of the system. And then when the Thomas fire erupted on the 5th of December, that's the Thomas fire. So the Thomas fire in at least a uh, irradiation, a uh, 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 light context, irradiance context, not irradiation, ir irradiance, um, it is about as bright as LA. That's crazy, right? Crazy, crazy times, crazy scales of these disasters. Thomas fire went off, and if you guys want to talk to me about that, we can, but um, Thomas fire was crazy, yeah. Yeah. Is that like how thick the smoke is that you can actually see from space? That it glows? Yeah. Well, no, the, uh, near the, the, the islands, like, is that smoke? Right, right, you're talking about like, like this stuff, the light, this kind of stuff? Yeah. Yeah, so there's so much smoke that it's, it's the, the, the light from the fire is illuminating it. So it, it, it wouldn't, if you were, if you were <laughs> on an island and looking up, you, you couldn't see anything because there's smoke over your head. But if you could look up, it wouldn't be black. It would be like a, a, a soft glow. Was anybody here on the island during the Thomas fire? Some of my students were, but okay. Um, uh, and then we get you know, th these crazy impacts. And again, so this, this, no, this is not camp. This is Thomas fire. This is Ventura. This is the hills above Ventura, city of Ventura. And so another key thing that we'll see with these disasters is people go, I don't get it, right? These guys are fine. These guys are gone. It seems so random and everything. And, and that's just the happenstance of how the flames went, how the, fl how the sand caved under that particular levee. And so then we have this whole issue of, um, if we're fortunate enough that our whole town isn't wiped off, in the case of you know, paradise, the whole, everything was gone. But, but for most of these disasters, we have this you know, lucky few. And then those people have survivor's guilt. And then, they have to live in a city that doesn't have neighbors and this and that. So, that, so these, again, very common properties of all of these disasters. Um, increasingly, though, we are also seeing these types of things. So unusual stuff that we hadn't really planned for. So these guys, obviously, they're addicted to surfing because they're surfers. Um, they're so addicted to surfing. And this was about three weeks into the Thomas fire when everything still looked orange all day long. They're like, dude, we gotta go surf. So the guy's wearing an N95 particle mask, the kind of thing you'd wear to do you know, construction or do fiberglassing of boards or something like that, to go surf. That's unusual. You're not supposed to have a breathing mask to go surfing. So we see these, these, just like we see some of these novel impacts, we see novel threats to human health a lot of times. It could be something like this, it could be floodwaters that are full of gasoline and the paints in your garage that are now all floating around. So another uh, stressor for us. So here is, we were just talking about um, uh, smoke and stuff like that. We were just talking about the island. Here's the, our island. So there's Santa Rosa Island Research Station. You can't see it because it's buried in the smoke. In fact, in this case, on, on this day, the smoke was way worse than on campus. So the folks who were out there, it was like hard to breathe some, sometimes, they said. So even our distant areas are can be touched by these fires. Even though there was no fire, quote unquote, out at Santa Rosa in our Channel Islands, they were impacted by this. And we're seeing these longer and longer tails of these disasters. When we burned some of the oil in the Deepwater Horizon, some of that stuff, that soot landed in Atlanta, right? And even farther away. So we're also seeing these large and larger scale events do have a footprint or a fingerprint 
uh, sometimes really far away. Thomas Fire was a really, really complete burn. These are the, this is the, some of the hills above uh, Ventura. Uh, and then sometimes these disasters keep going. So the film crews often show up. The TV news crews show up and they're like, oh my God, is the baby safe? Is it, uh, and then they tend to leave. A key th reason why we keep going back to New Orleans, why, why I'm very appreciative that you guys are coming with us to New Orleans, is one, to help out folks, but the other reason is to make sure our friends there don't feel forgotten. And that might sound kind of weird 14 years out, but a very, very common phenomenon we're seeing with Puerto Rico too, right? Which is people are like, okay, when the media were here, everybody cared, and now they left, but man, we got years of rebuilding left. Does anybody have our back? And so it's also really important to make sure that these folks know that we haven't forgotten about them, right? that they're not just some numbers and they're not off the page, but we really are paying attention. Sometimes we get a reminder. In the case of the Thomas Fire, we got a reminder. We got a reminder in the form of the Montecito mudslides, right? So that's what we're looking at here. So um, this was, uh, right, you know, so this is, this is after Christmas, this is after, um, this is in January. The, this was the predicted risk. And so we have the same models. Uh, Matt can tell you, I, I don't think these models are super accurate, um, but on a broad stroke, they are. So this is just looking at slope, aspect, what the soil is, and we, and we have these all for all of our areas right now. You can go look them up, USGS website. In this case, uh, the area that is more likely to, if you get an intense rainfall, uh, erode is the darker color. And so all these areas were potentially um, going to be a problem, and this is the fire perimeter that we're, we've shown on it. So days before, days before the Montecito mud flows, we started getting warnings like this from the USGS. Before New Orleans, we'll talk about, before Katrina, excuse me, we'll talk about some of the warnings. I often feel, many of us often feel like, like Cassandra or, or, or someone screaming and no one listening. Oh my God, you guys, it's like a thing, you gotta go. People are like, yeah, dude, whatever, nerd, right? I'm like, no, 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 it's like, it could be that. Yeah, uh huh, dude, right. <coughs> so unfortunately, in this case, um, people had been out of their homes for a long time. And you can imagine what the, you guys probably, a lot of you guys experience that yourself. Out of your home, out of your home, and it sucks. And this is the holidays. This is supposed to be the time you're hanging out with your family, right? And so people are like, I just wanna go home. And so these folks went home. The terminology we use to communicate these things um, is incredibly important. And so, you know, evacuation warning? Okay, right? Uh, so mandatory, warning, watch, all these terms, not everybody understands. I don't even understand them all the time. What do they mean? Does that mean we have to leave or get ready to leave or what? And so, uh, nevertheless, the, the experts were trying to warn people and unfortunately, a lot of people did not understand or really under, uh, see what was happening. Again, here's, here's that same uh, risk map. Ojai didn't burn, all the area burned. It just so happened that Montecito caught it. The rain cloud hung out right over here. It could have easily hung out right here, hung out right here, hung out right here, but it hung out right here in Montecito, just next to Santa Barbara. And, um, it, and it caused all kinds of problems. This is the after the flood happened. This is a citizen science, a crowdsourced map that was done by folks who just started doing stuff and then eventually a couple hundred thousand people started viewing this map and adding stuff. So this is where the destruction was. This was before first responders had done an inventory. This was the, the residents of Montecito essentially doing this themselves. The blue I've put on there, that is, those are the creeks. Those are the, the waterways. That's where the, the water and debris wanted to go. And surprise, surprise, where were all the damaged homes and people that unfortunately died? They're right along those pathways, right? There, not that many houses got damaged up here, but these guys were damaged. So in hindsight, it makes, of course, perfect sense. But these folks didn't understand, most of these folks didn't understand that. So they weren't trying to be stupid, they weren't trying to be ignorant, they just didn't really get the risk. They went to bed and all of a sudden in the middle of the night, they found mud flowing through their house or, or some such thing massive scales, massive scales of flooding in New Orleans, massive scales of flooding in Thomas Fire, um, campfire, all these things. Um, how you, like, and, then, and then this is the phase of cleanup. These you know, firemen are like, uh, well, how do we 
what, what? You know, the boulder is the size of this, half of this size of this room, you know, in the middle of roads. How do you, how do you get rid of that? In the case of New Orleans uh, and, and Mississippi Coast and places like that, oil tank, in some case tankers on land, on the highway. Like what? How the hell do you get a tanker off a highway, right? Things of that nature. Um, and so, so that's that. And then I always want to end with showing you guys a couple quick videos right here from the last, uh, last month. Let, let's, let's start with this. So this is um, a radio on November 14th, and this is just driving on the road here above campus. Four, I'm Willa Sandmeyer with KCLU News. The massive Woolsey fire in Ventura and Los Angeles counties reminds people it's still far from being under control. A flare-up in the rugged mountains northwest of Lake Sherwood yesterday sent a massive plume of smoke into the air. It was visible as far That's what as shut Los campus Angeles down for two weeks. Santa Barbara County. A fleet of more than a half dozen helicopters aided by a gigantic DC-10 air tanker corralled the flare-up in about two hours. No structures were damaged. The fire has burned some 97,000 acres of land or an area the size of the city of Denver. It's now 40% contained. Full containment had originally been projected for Thursday. The target is now Saturday. Two deaths, which are still under investigation, are believed to be fire-related. Three firefighters have been injured. The official tally of structures burned stands at just over 430, but firefighters say that number will grow as a comprehensive survey of the burn area is completed. A community meeting is planned for Ventura County residents tonight. Residents affected by the Wilson Brush fire. So that's the tail end of that flare-up. So that, that's, a, that's a classic case, right? So what's going on? I have no idea. And there's this giant chunk of, you know, huge flare up. And um, right, you guys all experience that, right? There's all these, this information is coming in and what's going on and the politicians are talking and, and it's just, it's hard to make sense of what's going on. And there's this big giant flame over there and there's no helicopters flying and things of that nature. So it can be really scary and really confusing. And just to show you how ubiquitous or how, um, just to show you how common the human reactions are, this is the very first um, press conference, or not, that's not right, not press conference, the very first public meeting, excuse me, after the Woolsey fire, and this was in Woodland Hills, so this is in, you know, the valley, and this was Senator Stern called this, and to his credit, he hung out the whole, we'll say here as long as we can, it was hours and hours. So there was police, fire, those folks gave you know updates, briefings, which is cool, but after you know 20 minutes, half an hour, then it just became question time. And so we won't watch hours and hours of this, but we'll just watch a little teeny bit of this. I'd like to tell people that are trying to access Malibu by boat to please not do that. We're making the job very difficult for the lifeguards that are trying to secure the city, along with the members of law enforcement. I want to know. Why, 
Uh, folks trying to go into the fire zone on their yachts, that's an unusual thing. Uh, the law enforcement officials asking people to please not bring your yacht into here because it's taking away our safety, our public safety folks from, from doing important things, right? But then that was a little teeny excerpt. At that meeting, it was hours of people like that lady. Understandably, right, it sucks. If you're a millionaire and you lose your house, it sucks. If you're a, a poor person, little shack, it sucks. It sucks whoever you are to lose all your stuff, to lose your home. I would posit, though, that um, while not everyone by any means, the majority of folks in Malibu have some amount of fiscal wherewithal. Um, there is a massive amount of anger that we saw, that I, I saw, and part of that as this lady was expressing, why wasn't there, why aren't there helicopters flying over my house right now showing me if my house is there, right? An understandable, you know, gut reaction maybe, but maybe that doesn't show a complete appreciation for all the challenges of the firefighters that were currently fighting the fire as we sp speak, right? So their charge was how do we get people safe? How do we, how do we manage the situation? And then when we have time, we'll go back and see who's whose houses were messed up or whatever, right? But I mean, outrage from those folks. And I heard some people saying things like, why wasn't there a fire truck in front of my house? Not, why wasn't there a fire truck in my neighborhood? Why wasn't there a fire truck in front of my house? And uh, one situation, one of my friends who's a firefighter told us, told me it happened. They were, they were out there in an uh, area near Bell Canyon and they were fighting, uh, trying to save this guy's house. All of a sudden, they got a phone call that there was somebody trapped in another house, you know, blocks away or some distance away. So they started rolling up the hoses. And the owner was there. And again, this is a big, giant, expensive house, but it could have been the, you know, a fallen down house, it doesn't matter. Firefighters would try to save it. And and uh, the guy's like, what are you doing? The fire is still, you know, my house is still threatened. There's still fire. They said, oh yeah, we gotta, there's a guy that's in his house. We gotta go try to get him out. And the gentleman said, uh, dude, that guy stayed in his house. F him, right? He goes, like, you're here right now, save my house. And the firefighter's like, sir, there's a person that might die. And the guy's like, you know, so, so um, we also have to deal with that, right, in these disasters. And, and that, so, so economic inequality, power, privilege, all that stuff that happens outside of disasters also happens inside disasters. Wasn't there a weird thing with like Kim Kardashian and Kanye buying like, or paying for uh, firefighters to yes. save a home? Yes, so that wasn't, that, I mean, that, that, there were the, ones with the biggest Instagram, or whatever, but that happened in many places. So um, wealthy, in the case of fire now, so this, this, is, this is different than what we'd see in New Orleans. And when the hurricane comes, ain't no, ain't no private dude gonna save you from the hurricane. But, but in the case of fires, um, folks that have very expensive properties a lot of times will hire their own um, sort of fire suppression things. And that takes var various forms. Some cases, the folks come in and just spray essentially fire retardant over their homes and things like that. Uh, people portray it sometimes as actually their own private fire, um, fire teams. Those do exist, but that's not really exactly what it is. Um, uh, but the best example I can give you is so the weekend before the fire, my son's Boy Scout troop was up. Um, we do a, a fundraiser for this gentleman that passed away. There's a bike race that goes through the mountains and so called the Nosco bike race. So we were doing that and we were up in uh, up uh, Canaan, uh, up at this park area, up in the middle of the Santa Monica's. And so we were um, uh, manning first aid stations and giving people water and stuff. And it's right across from a place called Calamigos Ranch. Has anybody been to Calamigos Ranch? I worked 
Oh, so you weren't seeing. Look at this. Walker can tell us all about this. Their fire suppression system. Yeah. 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 So, was this about two years ago? There was like a small fire we had up there by the property when it came up behind uh, Broncos Estate, and the owner Glenn was just like, "Nope, screw this," because we had the fire captain come in and he came. They come to inspect our property every once in a while, but it's so underground with trees and wood buildings <coughs> and everything. They said, "If the fire comes, we're just gonna." drive-by, not going to do anything. So the fire department said that. Yeah, fire yep. department said not going to do anything. We'll stand outside and we're going to watch for because there's nothing we can do. So and so for folks who haven't been there, this is sort of a big venue place where you have like multiple, like how many weddings do you guys yeah, have at a time? We have four wedding venues, a hotel, a Malibu cafe, private houses, Pepperdine student housing, we've got a whole bunch. So it's a huge of complex of stuff. 250 acres. Huge complex. Okay, keep going. So when... When Gerson, the owner, he, he decided to, uh, we have a couple big ponds around the property, so he decided to get a big old diesel engine and hook up a massive water pump to it and put sprinklers all over the entire property. Yeah, up on, you know, huge, huge, tall, like, in, like, like rainbirds, yeah, really tall so, rainbirds. And they put out about, what do you say, 5,000 gallons a minute of water. And he waited until that fire came basically across the street and flipped the switch for that thing and it bumped the humidity up just enough and got everything wet enough that the fire went. So you guys lost like two outbuildings or something like that? He like lost uh, Garner Gerson, my son, the son of the owner, he lost his house in the back half. Um, a lot of the undeveloped stuff that we have in the back, all the hillsides and everything, those burnt down. Malibu Wines, which is on our property, that or stuff all burnt down, but no. There was a few things that we lost, but not, nothing, none of our like, business stuff. So, so those guys um, had a plan, and their plan was, which is, is crazy, this is just open air, right? It's not inside a place, to increase the relative humidity in the air so that, um, you know, if a flame came, a flame came, but, but if you had an ember fl floating and it landed, it wouldn't be crazy dry, right? So it'd be enough that you could get and obviously spray some water on it and kill it. Uh, Yeah, so so we were we had been there the week I had been walking around the week before and when the fire came up I was like, oh dude, it's like gone, right? I mean, it's eucalyptus trees, it's you know you just look at it and you're like, oh my gosh, it's totally not savable, and those guys saved it. So in that case, that wasn't a pri well I guess it wasn't pri I mean, it was you guys, but but I mean it was it wasn't like a contractor. It's just those guys decided that's what we're gonna do. Um, so those things absolutely happen and will happen more and more. But they're not going to happen to the low-income housing, right? That's going to happen to the the maybe important museum or the mayor's palace, the mayor's palace, the mayor's uh, residence, or something like that. Um, and so that worked for these guys because they had their own ponds on the property, right? Their own reservoirs. They could just do that. Most folks don't have those things. So that's what that's what happened when you're asking about the the. Uh, that gonna be was saying, you know, a lot of those houses have pools up there. How come they're not tapping into the, the whatever fifty thousand gallons of pool? Water that's what that's what my that's what my firefighter friend said. Like, Man, if this was my house, I would have a, a little pump and like an autonomous, you know, yeah. So, so yeah. So so um, what our what our firefighter friends would say is don't do that because they would say if you're going to stay back and fight your fire, you you, you know you're going to be staying back. And you're going to be putting yourself at risk, and the fireman might have to come through and 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 get you. And so it's it's, you know, this is the landscape in which we live. So the last one I'll just mention really quick, since we're talking about how people respond. So um, Pepperdine, right? So Pepperdine has, a, you know, obviously a, a large group of people. Fire happens. They 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 moved the and you guys know, right? It happened. At, it started happening. Then at night, it really went crazy. So they had their. Um, students who they don't necessarily have cars, right? You, you guys don't all necessarily have cars. And so they, they took them and they put them in a, a, um, one of their buildings for a while. And they're like, okay, well, you know, we got to shelter, the approach in that case is called shelter in place. So we got to stay here where it's, where it's not going to burn, you know, like a place that won't burn up immediately. 
And then they're like, okay, yeah, screw that. We're going to take you guys back to the, the central area on campus, the, whatever it was, the library and the cafeteria, or whatever, whatever those areas were. And, um, and one of our students, his friend goes there. And so he was saying, his friend was there. He's like, we should get out of here. And the, the uh, authorities, the, the administration and stuff said, no, no, you guys got to stay here. It's all good. I know it looks scary. Fire's coming over the hill, but just stay here. And he's like, oh, man, we got to get out of here, man. And they're like, no, 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 stay. So the dude was like, F this, went and got in his truck. And, you know, Pepperdine is right next to Malibu Canyon, Las Virgins Road. And he got on Las Virgins. He started driving uh, uh, toward the valley, like, so, so inland. And by the time he got halfway through, the flames were on both sides of the road, and they're coming up to the road. And so he got out. Uh, truck got scorched. Thankfully, he was okay. But... He said if he'd left five minutes later, he would have burned up on the road. There was like no way to get through. It was just like flame, 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 flame. So that dude was super lucky. That was not the smart move. The smart move was to, as scary as it was, was in that particular case, was to stay um, at, you know, in the central area, shelter in place. Um, but that, it's human nature, right? Some people just get freaked out. Some people, some people panic, some people think they know this or that or whatever. So my wife says, I'm the, somebody's gonna die in one of these things. So I'll be like, oh, let me tell you what to do. And then I'll, we'll drive down some canyon and like, I'll be trying to catch some animal or something. It's like, you didn't die. But, but, but those are all real things, right? And so in the case of New Orleans and, and the future, the planet we're inheriting, we need to sort of think about all that stuff, all the regular social inequality and people don't have cars and that kind of jazz merged with the folks that think that they should hire their own uh, private armies and this and that and the folks that this and the this and the this, these are very complex situations. And looking back, um, it, you know, hindsight's you know, perfect, right? When you ask me on Monday who won the Super Bowl, well, of course blah, blah, blah won, right? But um, so that, that's all part of this. And so um, we're going to go into this with open eyes, not judging people. We're going to check it out. There should be some judgments made, okay? And um, while you know we're not trying to throw people under the bus per se, there are some effed up things that happened. And if we're going to get better, we need to, uh, in a fair and honest way, call BS BS when it happens. And when we elect leaders to be in charge of us, in the case of Oroville Dam, Thomas Fire, Hurricane Katrina, they need to be actual leaders. And they need to be able to have the wherewithal, the, the talent, the understanding to pull the experts together to help us get through these disasters and, super importantly, plan for it. So it's not enough to just have a heroic you know, macho dude with a cut jaw coming in through the smoke, saving the poor puppy, right? Those are, that's cool and all. But when that happens, we've already lost. We want to see if we can forestall that from happening in the first place, and that gets to planning. That gets to understanding what happened with these situations, and that gets to us going to New Orleans and Louisiana and understanding what happened there. All kinds of lessons and cool stuff there that not only are, are going to be able, uh, that not only benefit our friends and, and uh, colleagues in New Orleans will benefit us here and wherever you guys go. Cool? Okay, so with that intro, next week we'll start in talking about Louisiana. All right, cool. Sound good? All right, rock and roll team.